So my guest on the show today, if you all could be a fly on the wall in the conversations that I have been having with this woman and the energy that is just coming through the screen and every conversation we have, oh my gosh, you would lose it. So I want to introduce you to Miss Marky. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It is a wonderful day. I always tell people in the almighty world of real estate, and I'm coming to you today from the south side of the city of Chicago. Just, just next door. Oh down the road. God. Just a little bit down right, the road. Right. Little neighbors, little neighbors, little neighbors. So I love it. I love it. I always like to start off just getting grounded in why your why is marky doing what she is doing in this business that you've got going right now why why here's what's unique i was born and raised an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. so i am a proud chicago fifth generation entrepreneur and if i really looked at my why it would go back to my mother so my mother was a 17 year old teen parent unwedded. And my mother quit her job at ARA services to go sell hot dogs in the park. My mother had a food truck in Chicago in 1982. And I realized my mother made a lot of sacrifices to allow me to do what it is that I do. She was my number one advocate. And so when you're born and raised as an entrepreneur and you understand how that empowers you and you can get up every single day energetic to go do what it is that you do, Mm -hmm. you want a piece of that. Now, you know, I'm I'm formally educated and I got a bunch of real estate licenses, designations and certifications, 61 to be exact. (laughs) But my mother made a sacrifice for me to be able to do exactly what I want to do, how I do it every single day and essentially without fear. And you know what, you know, that's something that you don't often hear in this context. And I say that very honestly, because most times when I ask the question about why there's something that happened in life, right, that has prompted very often entrepreneurs that has prompted us or our own just desire for creative, for freedom and having our creativity come out without restraint. Listening to you say, hey, my mom paved the way and it almost sounds like it's my duty to maintain this freedom she showed me that it's possible like that's that's, here's what's interesting so i've had jobs right when you are born and raised as an entrepreneur i realized i had my first business failure at the age of 21, I owned a restaurant called Looney's. It was very popular here in the city of Chicago. The community had transitioned, transformed, whatever word you desire to use, but the community wasn't what it once was. And the restaurant failed. But at the same time, I was operating our successful concession business. And at the same time, my family actually owned Chicago's second oldest black restaurant. We've been in business since 1954. We have sold more pork rib tips than anyone else in the city of Chicago. So I'm seeing what success looks like, but I'm feeling failure at the same identical time. So I had a successful business and a business failing at the same time. And what I realized then was I didn't know enough. That's how I took it. And that it was my responsibility to continue to educate myself, but I had some big I had these big footsteps that I needed to feel. Mm -hmm. And if my grandfather could come from Mississippi with nothing, uneducated and one pair of shoes with holes in it, and he essentially has taken care of four generations, I got to do something better. Mm -hmm. If not, I'm I'm a failure is kind of how I look at it. But I've had uh, two real jobs is what I, because of this entrepreneurship thing, people don't uh, claim it is real. It's real. But mm-hmm. I uh, actually worked for the Marriott Corporation in college. So I got f- my feel of that. And then I went and worked at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals as a pharmaceutical sales rep. What reason for me always taking a job was, I guess, to <laughs> assure my value, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they say you worth this. This is what you're worth but also to understand what they were doing in corporate America that we might not be doing in our establishments and how to bring that back to the community. Pause. Strategy. That's what just, that's what just came out of your mouth. So for everybody, everybody listening or watching right now at this moment, who is still inside of your nine to five, especially if you are in corporate America, 
like hear what you just said. Like not only I'm going to, we going to, the part we don't want you to have in your mind, because I know what that's like, that reassurance of the value, nothing to reassure you. We've learned that Marky. <laughs> but this other piece though, around, Hey, I'm watching, I'm taking notes. There's something here that I can use that furthers that thing that we own, that legacy thing that we're building. Let me talk about that reassurance. So I took a sabbatical from being a loan originator, which was my first job in real estate, mm -hmm. um, because I too was a, a unwedded mother and I wanted to go and get me a corporate job. I wanted that Pfizer car. I wanted that expense account and I wanted the salary with the bonus. And so I actually got hired at Pfizer with no pharmaceutical and actually really no formal sales skills. What I did was I had strong marketing skills and I had great marketing success. And so I'm like, oh, but marketing and sales can go hand in hand. So I repositioned my, my resume. When I was at Pfizer, I came home one day, I told my mother, I said, I absolutely hate this job. Like I hate it. And my mother said, Marky, you need to have, and I want to pull these great, these are organic whole food mustard seeds. And my mother said, Marky, you need to have the faith of a mustard seed. You can always go and get another job. So I left Pfizer in September of 2003. And in December of 2003, I had closed $24,000, a little bit over $24,000 and gross closed commission from selling real estate. Mm -hmm. And I just did some simple math. Mm -hmm. And what it told me was I would need to work in pharmaceutical sales. I would need to be miserable for 10 years mm -hmm. to earn in one month what I had just earned in a month of only coming back to the industry full time in September. And I said, Marky, you can make this happen. So Mm -hmm. Ever since December of 2003, I said, you know what, you're going to figure out how to make this happen. And in 2004, I was in the top 10% of realtors in the city of Chicago. So that means I did $12 million in volume. Look at that. $12 million, But I had to have, look here. These, I tell everybody, these are some good mustard seeds. These no ordinary mustard seeds. You got to have the faith of a mustard seed. Mm, mm. And you know what? Talk, talk, talk about this a little bit, right? 2003, and then you leap out on your own. And of course, your brilliance just exploded. That was always there. It, it was up to you to say, yeah, okay, you're right. It is real, God. Yeah, you're right. You have given me the talent. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna step out and go. But talk to me about your mind. Because there, there are so many folks who are like, I'm not sure it's possible. Like they've painted this picture. And again, I always advocate for being responsible. I advocate for no one just jumping off of a cliff. You, you think through, right? You got to think through this. But just talk about your mental game while you're making that decision to go. In making that decision to go, I'm like you. And I had, re I had real grown folks responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I owned real estate. I'm a single parent. My oldest son's father did not contribute in 20, the boy is 25, in 25 years, he did not give up more than $5,000. Mm -hmm. I intentionally went and took him off of child support because if I was going to have a relationship with him, I didn't want it to be tied to money. OK, mm -hmm. needless to say, we didn't have a relationship because it was tied to money. But with that being said, when we start thinking about this, I 100% believe that you should have a business plan. I don't make emotional decisions. Everything that I do in my business, I take the time to sit down to work a solid business plan and I follow the numbers. A lot of us, we have great, brilliant ideas, but we don't have numbers to support that idea. So even though I think that we are brilliant and we have all of these great ideas, you want to understand exactly where this income is going to come from. But more importantly, what is the persona, the avatar, the personality uh, of the people in which you need to connect with in order to make the amount of money that you desire to make. Mm -hmm. And even till this day, everything that I do, I am researching those numbers. I understand the probability of something occurring between zero and one. And so I have nine streams of income 
all derived from some factor of real estate and every last one of them I've done research on. But here's what's funny. My coach last year, I had to sit down and go through all these sources of income. And his response to me was, I want to see how your actions correlate to your earnings, right? Mm -hmm. And as I'm doing this exercise, I realized there's some things I probably should not be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was taking more actions, but it wasn't generating me the highest return on my time invested. Mm -hmm. I sat down and I shifted my priorities. And then because there's some things that I like to do, but it's not the best utilization of my time, I decided what type of partnerships can I enter into to make this more beneficial? An example would be the sweatshirt that I have on. I decided to partner with a company substantially bigger, more visible than myself, because every single time I show up for a real estate event, I need to have on real estate clothing. I'm not, I don't want to wear it and brand someone else. I want to brand something that I created. And no, I shouldn't have the clothing line. I should partner with a clothing line and do a collaboration. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what? I want everybody to take note. There is so there are so many like if you don't have your pen and paper, you can come back and watch this. You can come back and listen, whatever, because you will need to. There are gems everywhere here, and I love how you brought in the numbers piece because so there's something I, I always say to folks, and especially clients in the accelerator, is listen, building a business is systemic. Believe me, right? It's systemic. When you have some of the key factors like you talked about, right? Do you, one, do you have something that people either need, it's going to take them out of pain, or they're extremely delighted to buy because it's going to increase their pleasure? Do you know who they are? Can they afford to buy it? And do they know you, right? Your marketing, your everything to get it going. And so I love how you just broke that down because that is often a missed piece. Oh no, I want to do this. Or people are disappointed because something didn't work out but they didn't necessarily play with the pieces. It was just kind of like, I failed. I don't know why, but I failed. Talking about playing with the pieces because I'm in an interesting uh, situation right now today. And that is I have technically been gainfully unemployed from my primary source of income being self-employed, right? Mm -hmm. So historically, I am a real estate keynote speaker. I have stepped foot in 46 states in in the good United States of America, had 100 events booked in 2020, had already traveled the distance around the world from January the 1st until March the 13th, 2020, when I was forced to come home and I've not been on a plane since. Mm -hmm. However, I had to pivot. So I had to sit down and look at those numbers again and figure out, girl, (laughs) You won't have a source of income anymore. And lucky for me, I practice what I preach. So I told people video, that 100 face-to-face events, we pivoted to 125 paid webinars in 2020, we'll deliver 250 plus this year. And so I understood who the avatar was. I understood what that new need was and I pivoted. However, there, I have competition in that space. We have not seen them since. I just got my first 2020 book, 2022 booking for April the 6th of 2022 because mm-hmm. I've maintained the visibility. And so you have to have something viable. You need to understand what those changes are. And last night we delivered a new program called Operation I've Got Houses for Sale. Mm-hmm. His, I was the queen of foreclosures, had a lot of foreclosure short sale curriculum. Because of the moratorium, foreclosures are not hitting the market the way that we thought they were, which would give us inventory on the street. Because inventory, real estate inventory is dry, okay? Mm-hmm. I needed something in between time, right? Came out with Operation I've Got Houses for Sale. We had 193 people, get this, registered for a $297 course that essentially three weeks ago didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I love it. You see what I'm saying? But that's because I understand that 
audience. I know them like the back of my hand. And as a result of knowing them and having an intimate relationship with them, we've had that opportunity to pivot. But I don't want nobody to be confused. I am gainfully unemployed from what was my primary source of income for 14 years. It don't even exist. Right now in this moment, it don't even exist. Mm-hmm. It's coming you back. Know, <laughs> but it don't, it don't exist at this moment. <laughs> And this is, this is a good time to just talk for a second about riskiness when we talk about entrepreneurship. And I think it was last week or the week before last, I did a live in the Facebook group that was about busting some myths, right? Like it's risky for me to jump into entrepreneurship. Now, while there is some element of risk, right, because you haven't yet figured out or built up the mental pathways to be able to pivot right? Like what you're hearing from a market, that's a pivot situation. Now, imagine if you haven't built up those skills and you're at that employer, by the way, you can learn how to pivot while you are still employed. You do not need to stop to start. But if you haven't, you're in a riskier place. You just lean in on this thing. When you get yourself in a situation where, oh, okay, I built up this business and oh, I've got the opportunity. Oh, I see that need over here. I can do this. Oh, wow. That one's even bigger than this. Oh, and I like it. And that is the ideal space to play in. So I love that you brought that up because that's, that is everything. Like that is an, an entrepreneur's center to be able to pivot quickly and see the opportunity and chase it and get it. I love that. Yeah, you got to be able to pivot. And what I've come to realize, Bob, when you think about the world of real estate, we are often the third, fourth, fifth occupation for a lot of people. Some people get a license for when they retire, Mm -hmm. but they were never taught entrepreneurship in their occupation. That means they they are having a hard time with this as a transition. Mm -hmm. The next thing is they weren't life learners in the first Mm -hmm. place. Uh, I tell people to be a successful entrepreneur today, you need to understand that you have to commit to being a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, I was raised totally opposite than that. So my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago. I am, we don't even have a POS system till this day, 1954. Sell a, they sell, let's go $2.2 million worth of barbecue. Mm -hmm. My granddaddy comes in, would come in every morning. He would grab a brown paper bag because we bag our food in the brown paper bag. And he would write his order on the back of his brown paper bag. Mm -hmm. He could do that that likely would not work with a startup today, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. It would not work, but it worked for him because he had become the face of the business. The open barbecue pit is now really, it's vintage because a lot of people have smokers. People believe in tradition. He's in a, he's in a good corridor that they have a lot of bars. And so when you get drunk at night, you like to have that barbecue to soak that liquor up. Unique, but what he was doing or what my aunt and my cousins and my brothers do right now, you can't do that. You are not, you should not be opening a barbecue restaurant today without a POS. <laughs> you right? really learn, right. So he didn't have to pivot, but let me give you an example. Let what- me just say one thing on that really quick, Marky, because they're even in that, and what your grandfather did for so long and building such a successful business, there's another lesson in that. And that is when you feel the need that you need the latest everything, because I come across this, I come across the questions about the funnels and the specific of what site are you using for this candidate and what do you do for this and what do you do for that? And I said, hold on, have you sold anything? (laughs) Have you sold anything yet? You have something that people want to buy. We don't need the fancy stuff till you've proven out the basics. And in your granted $2.2 million worth of barbecue, right, to the person that is listening or watching, figure out the thing that people need. Figure that out. <laughs> you you have to. Right, right? Yeah. And we sell only pork rib tips and the, and the menu has not changed. Let me just get that straight. The menu has it's been the same menu my entire life. I'm 50. It has not <laughs> changed in my 50 years of existence. So what you just said, because I always had to tell my son, because he's 24 and he's an entrepreneur too. I said, Skyler, we have to stop putting the cart before the horse. Mm-hmm. And I want you to have a big, hairy, audacious goal. Mm -hmm. But those businesses that are uh, sustainable, they have systems 
today and they do a small batch or they do a test market or they do A-B testing to see, do people really even want what it is that I'm talking about? And I think that people think of it as failure because people don't want your idea. It just means that you got to dig deeper. And here would be the prime example. I've been teaching social media and technology classes probably since about 2008. Mm -hmm. They didn't become popular until 2012. Mm -hmm. Every year, they have become more and more popular. I was talking about video the whole time. Video to me just took off in 2020. I have a video on Facebook about how to do a mock open house using Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. I created that video in 2016. It wasn't until March of 2020, it became popular. Mm -hmm. So sometimes timing is everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you don't have a good idea. It just means that maybe you are ahead Mm -hmm. of the thinking of the people who you need to do business with. And I've experienced that on numerous occasions. You're not going to force someone into getting ready. It means, I just told you guys, I got a class, the ADPR. It's a hitter. I already know this. I've already had 5,000 people, 2008, 2012, to take this program. I know it's solid. I got every review and testimony from that time. But because of the memoratorium, it is not the most advantageous time to re-release that curriculum. Mm. So I came up with what? The operation, I've got houses for sale because inventory is a problem right now. Mm-hmm. essentially we generated $50,000 for an eight hour course in two weeks. Mm-hmm. That lets me know, yep, timing was great. That ADPR, I'm pushing it off until Joe or whoever says, look, we're going to lift this memoratorium. That means then those notice of default filings and them going through the process is going to start to speed up. I'm going to come with that education right at that point And it's going to be sweet. Right at the right time. Product, timing, price, positioning, everything. Ooh, I love it. Yeah. You know what? Tell us, Marky, because you are fearless. When I say fearless, I say that from the outside looking in, right? You may say something else. I don't know. But <laughs> talk to me about being both fearless and visible. How do you stay fearless and visible? You know what? I have, I've always been me. And 50-year-old me, realized that I was quite overwhelming as a little girl, as a teenager, because the same sash you see right now, that was three-year-old Mark. And so I understand that I was a handful is how I would probably like to put it. When I think about fearless, in my world, I am the shortest, darkest, roundest person in the room with the least amount of hair. But I take great pride in being different. Like, I, I, I get off on that. That just turns me on because I don't want to look like you and be like you anyway. I want to do it my way and put my stamp on it. I would say that the, the faith of the mustard seed, being made to pray. Like, my great-grandmother, I used to sleep in the bed with her because we my mother still lived at home. And before I could lay in her bed, I had to pray. So that was something that was instilled in me at the age of three. But I'm going to tell you something. I've never told anybody this, thinking about fearless and and prayer. I used to suck my thumb. I've never told anybody this. And I I love this thumb. And it's so long ago, I don't even remember which thumb it was. But it was one of... Did you not tell anybody? Were you ashamed of that? that, that I've never told anyone... I've never told anyone publicly that I was a thumb sucker when I was a child. So you're the first person for me to tell this story to, right? Because I I think it comes into the question that you asked me. So I went to this place called Susanna Wesley. It was a summer camp and it was a set of sisters there and they were teasing me all the time. And I knew that I needed my thumb to comfort me in order to go to sleep during the little cots. And I went and I prayed and I said, God, please let me stop sucking my thumb because these girls are going to tease me like relentlessly. And because people say, how do you, where's your faith start? And it started then because I don't know when I stopped sucking the dang on thumb. Mm -hmm. I just know I ain't sucked the thumb since. And my great grandmother 
making me, showing me how she was an entrepreneur. She owned a paper stand. My great-grandfather sold popcorn. They sent six kids to college. And my great-grandmother bought her first property in the 1950s as a un- great-grandmother, first property in the 1950s. It was seeing it firsthand. So when people ask me about who your heroes are in my family, I can pull any one of my family members. I've never had to go outside of my family because they were entrepreneurs, because my great grandmother was a a praying woman who had sent six kids to college off of selling newspapers and popcorn. Wow. 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 And you know, like I'm trying to figure out how did she even manifest that? And she had a two flat. (laughs) <laughs> when blacks technically couldn't even buy real estate i still own that land right now that see, the two flat was on see that's the kind of thing though that is the there's a documentary on pbs oh what is it called you may even know which one i'm talking about it's called something it's it's about the black experience in business i can't think of what it's called but <laughs> just hearing you tell that to me that does something to me like it it makes me go yeah you can't yeah you gotta keep going there is no you gotta keep going you have to keep going you can't allow a legacy like that to just hang out and wait and be read in a book when you can establish the next chapter that's powerful Marky. oh my goodness but i want people to know i've had failures i've had the opportunity to lose everything twice Financially, when the real estate market crashed, I crashed right along with it. I will tell everyone, though, I was mentally disconnected from the financial loss because at the same time, my mother died from a brain aneurysm. My my other grandfather, not in the barbecue business, died as a result of Alzheimer's disease. I had my third bout of pneumonia, it covered 70% of my left lung. I was a high risk pregnancy because I was 36 years old and then I fainted on an airplane pregnant and was told, you know what, you need to make a decision. <laughs> Either you're going to keep running like you running or you can have you a healthy baby. And so in the midst of the foreclosure market and creating the ADP, I had, I was just disconnected from the world. And it actually took me until about 2012, 2013 to just really sit down and look at everything and be like, girl, you've been through something. Mm -hmm. because I wasn't mentally connected to the financial loss. I was 100% disconnected. And the first time that I lost everything, I went through a bitter lawsuit with my family because I owned the trademark right for Lamb's Barbecue and my father's sister sued me. And so to go through, I countersued them. So I tell everybody behind every lawsuit is a counter lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Exercise your right to countersuit, okay? But in the midst of that, you're talking about I was born and raised in the restaurant business. My undergrad degree is in hospitality management. Mm -hmm. I had my food and sanitation license. My grandfather sent me to get an MBA degree to help the barbecue business. So essentially, I had to start life all over again and chose real estate. But I will say this. My father's sister suing me is absolutely one of the best things anyone has ever done for me because I was free to create my own legacy. So Mm -hmm. even though uh, a lot of things were instilled, can't nobody claim none of this. I built all of this from scratch. And there's an amount of satisfaction that comes from that. Because a lot of people say what your granddaddy did, what your mama did, oh, they was good to me. Mm -hmm. And they gave me, and they educated me. I'm thankful for that. They instilled a strong work ethic, but everything over here, Marky built, can't nobody claim no parts of it because I started over from ground zero. Mm -hmm. And that free to create and with the ambition and knowing what you're hitting, man. (laughs) And you don't have to argue with nobody. Like, Uh here's the joy of what I'm doing. I don't have to argue with no one to make any money. I don't have any arguments with anyone on (laughs) any level. I don't know if people understand that. There's no one belittling me. There's no one putting me down. You will talk to me the way in which I desire to be talked to. 
If not, we don't have to do business. And I'm okay, because I'm living below my means anyway. I'm okay. And so I've had the occasion in the past year to have two people get out of pocket. Both of them are family members. And here's the thing. I don't make money with you no way. Pause for a second, because that is another valuable. Listen, that's a valuable line right there. When you catch yourself, either your emotions are high with people who are wasting your time. I don't make money with you anyway. <laughs> like we have this conversation. <laughs> Keep going, Marky. Oh my gosh, this is real. So I hear about real estate teams and people in real estate all the time and how they might talk to people. And I'm sitting there, I'm in just, I'm baffled. I'm like, they said, what? I'm like, and you went for that? You do know you self-employed. <laughs> you do, no, for real now. You do realize you're an independent contractor and you don't have to subject yourself to that. So you, you won't, I'm respect gets respect is how I look at it. I think it's begets or whatever the word is. I'm going to respect you because I expect and demand that you're going to respect me. I'm not going to treat you any different than how I want to be treated. But I, I, no one has talked crazy to me. I pop out of bed every single morning, elated to come and do my job and perform at its highest level. Or if I do something wrong, I'm researching how to make sure I don't make that mistake again. It's I'm happy. No amount of money can compensate you for that. Either I'm going to be happy and do this, or I, I don't have to do this. I can choose to do something else. We got the skill set. You can take that skill set and parlay it into so many different things. But no, I, I don't understand the person come in the morning with the attitude and the this. And, oh, yeah. No, we, you don't have to do that. <laughs> that's true that's true but you know that's also and especially in your line of work given that you deal so heavily with real estate agents and for those real estate agents who are coming to learn from you and be in your community and that type of thing just like you were talking earlier about them not necessarily having that entrepreneurial mindset especially if they transitioned from i was working here now I'm working with, I don't know, Keller Williams, Shore West, Century 21, whatever. And I still feel like I'm an employee and I don't recognize <laughs> that again. First off, if I don't do what I'm going to do, I'm not going to make money anyway. I don't know if they've started with real estate offices and given base committee. I don't think that they do that unless it's something that's new. I don't it's know. Or somebody. It might be two companies nationally that might pay you a base salary, but I will tell you they're going to work. You're going to work harder. You're going to actually earn less money per hour. And so for those who need that comfort to do real estate, because they love it, but they still want to check every 14 days or every 30 days, then by there are one to two franchise models in this country that will pay you a base salary and bonuses. But I can tell you those agents work substantially hard. Okay. So you may be able to find an opportunity, but if you want to be on that train of, I own it, I can do what I want to, and my income is in my control, then hey, you better get the entrepreneurial game mindset in check. Oh, yes. Those who have it in check earn the most amount of money per hour working the fewest hours possible. I love it. This conversation has been amazing. And Marky, if people are like, how do I get a hold of this woman? How do I even just get a little bit more of her energy, a little bit more of whatever? Or maybe they are listening and they want to go into real estate, right, as their next move and being an, an agent and that type of thing. How can they get a hold of you or just come into your circle? MarkyLemons.com. But I tell everyone, if you spell my name correctly, because I'm the only Marky Lemons in the world, you will find me. M A R K I lemons l-e-m-o-n-s please feel free to connect with me on any other platforms but markylemons.com i love it this conversation has been great just like every other one that we have had oh my gosh and i already said i since chicago is just around the door i already told my husband we gotta go to this like limbs barbecue like we need to just go over to chicago and just go and sit and chill and spend a couple days or whatever i'm just so thankful that you came on the show murky so thank you so much for being here Thank you for having me. And please feel free to come on down the road. We just a little south of you. For everyone listening and watching, you know what I always say, do not just take what you have heard and hold on to it. Don't do that. Take it and take some action. There's always an opportunity for action. So I hope you have a great day, a great evening whenever you are listening or watching. 
and I'll talk to you again soon.